Next, we'll examine an interesting example of how the Prophet ﷺ would treat captives. This is really important as we come to know the Rahmah and the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. It has been narrated that after the expedition of Qurta' for Qurta' in the year 6 after the Hijrah, remember we're now examining the events of the 6th year of the Hijrah, there was a captive by the name of Thumama ibn Athal or Athal. Thumama ibn Athal. He was taken as a captive by Muslims. Thumama was a very respected tribal leader in his area. He was a leader in the region of Yamama in the Arabian Peninsula. It wasn't too far from Medina, but it's to the east of Medina. So he was like a leader of that region, a tribal leader, almost king-like. It is not known exactly why he was taken as a captive. Some reports state he was determined to kill the Prophet. So news reached the Muslims and the Prophet that Thumama is planning to come and kill Rasulullah So they somehow managed to capture him as a captive. Al-Kulayni narrates in the book of Kafi a hadith in which the Prophet made a dua. He said, Allahumma makkinni min thumama. Oh Allah, give me power over thumama. And therefore, the horsemen of Muslims, they captured him. So he had done something disturbing for the Prophet to make such a dua. So it makes sense that he wanted to either kill Muslims, kill the Prophet. Another report states, that he was sent to see the Prophet in order to assassinate the Prophet. He was on an assassination mission. So in any case, he was taken as a captive. One narration states that he was in Medina and he wanted to go to Umrah to Mecca and that's when he was taken as a captive. In any case, those who took him as a captive according to certain reports, did not know that he was a leader and a master of his tribe, almost king-like. So when they take him to the Prophet the Prophet says, do you know who this guy is? He's asking his companions. They tell him no. The Prophet tells them he's a very important tribal leader. So the Prophet commands them to treat him well. Remember, he's a captive. He tried to assassinate the Prophet. The Prophet is saying, treat him well. By the standards of that time and by the standards of most times, someone who's come to assassinate the leader, the king, gets assassinated. They get killed, right? They are given the death penalty. But the Prophet does not administer the death penalty. The Prophet says, treat him well. In fact, narrations indicate the Prophet went to his family, to some of his wives, and he told them, gather whatever food you have and send it to Thumama. The Prophet normally, on a normal day, had very little food at home. Whatever little food he had, he told his family, give it to Thumama, our captive. Show me rahmah like that. See, there may be some countries, if they have prisoners of war, they'll give them food. But have you seen a country where the president goes hungry and he gives his food to the captive? Fadr, show me. Who's done that in history, other than the Ahlul Bayt? Who's done that? Yes, it's not unheard of to treat the captives well, you know, give them a place to stay, to give them food. That's not unheard of. It happens. But those captives who came to kill you, you take from your own food and give them, that's unheard of. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. He told his family, whatever food we have at home that's for us, give it to Thumama. Then the Prophet ﷺ would come to Thumama. He was tied, of course. He was arrested. He would come to him and the Prophet would tell him, O oh, Thumama, become a Muslim. I invite you to Islam. He refused. The Prophet came a second time and he told him, O oh, Thumama, I invite you to become a Muslim. He refused. The third day, the Prophet came to him, O oh, Thumama, become a Muslim. He refused. 
Now there are some people who say, look, the Prophet is pressuring him into becoming Muslim. Is that fair? Doesn't the Quran say there's no coercion in religion? The Prophet is like technically not coercing him, but he's really compelling him, he's pressuring him. How would we respond to that? Three days the Prophet comes and he tells him, Thumama, don't you want to become a Muslim? I invite you to become a Muslim. What do we say about that? If someone tells you, look, your Prophet is actually pressuring people to become Muslim. But why would the Prophet pressure him though? You asked him once, that's it. Why do you come every day and he's still tied? Maybe there's an indication if he becomes Muslim, the Prophet will free him. Right? Because if he stays as a Muslim, he's not going to be tied. I mean, they're going to free him. So how do we justify that? Those who say, doesn't the Quran say there's no coercion in religion? Well, technically he is being coerced. One answer that we can give, look, Thumama came as an assassin, he's a criminal, he's supposed to be killed. The Prophet's telling him basically, you deserve to be killed, I'm being nice with you. Now I invite you to become Muslim and, and you know, start fresh, we're giving you a new chance. You came from these pagan lands, corrupt mentality, you know, you have that thug mentality, you just want to go and assassinate. By becoming Muslim, I'm inviting you to the ideals of Islam. And if you accept them, then we'll take that as repentance from you. That's a beautiful way of encouraging him to change. So it's not that the Prophet is forcing people to become Muslim, but this guy was a criminal. So the Prophet is telling him, I'll let you free, but you have to accept Islamic ideals. Because that way we'll trust you more. But if you are not going to change, why should I release you? That's the idea behind it. Yet, even though he refused after the third time, guess what the Prophet did? He set him free. The Prophet said, Ya Allah, let him go free. When they set him free, even though he refused to become a Muslim, Thumama was moved. At that point, he saw the light of guidance. He went to a palm tree that was not too far from the masjid of the Prophet. He purified himself. Then he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You are the messenger of God. I've never seen such rahmah. I refused to become Muslim, yet you freed me. You just let me go. I'd come to assassinate you. And he pledged allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he wanted to go to Mecca to do the Umrah. He told the Prophet ﷺ, in our region, Yamama, we send food to the Quraysh of Mecca, like wheat, hunta. So I am going to punish them for fighting you and we'll stop sending them wheat. So he's showing his support to the Prophet. He was the first person to now go do Umrah. Umrah had not been, you know, revealed as a ritual to Muslims yet in year six, later it did, and the Hajj. So he was the first person to go to Mecca and do the Umrah. He just became a Muslim, so he went to do the Umrah. He went to Mecca and reports indicate he was the first to say the Talbiyah, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. So the Meccans told him, did you deviate? When they heard that he's saying there's no God but Allah, he told him, did you deviate? He said, no, I have not deviated. I have become a Muslim with the Prophet And then he threatens them. He tells them, look, here's the deal. Not a single grain of wheat will come to you from Yamama, from my you know, part of the Arabian Peninsula, unless the Prophet gives me permission. They got angry and they wanted to kill him. This first Muslim comes and he does the talbiyah, but hey, they realized, they realized that they needed him to, to survive. They needed his tribe. Because Mecca has a very difficult environment to grow wheat. You need wheat from other areas, it has to be imported. And so they would import some of their wheat from Yamama. So they don't want to be on his bad side, so they just left him alone. He returned to Yamama and he stopped all shipments of wheat to Mecca. To the point that Quraysh became hungry. The enemies of the Prophet became hungry. 
So the Meccans, they wrote a letter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they, they said in the letter, إِنَّكَ تَأْمُرُ بِصَلَةَ الرَّحْمِ Don't you command your people to have good ties with their family? وَإِنَّكَ قَدْ قَطَعْتَ أَرْحَامَنَا You've severed ties with us by making us go hungry. You've not been good to us. SubhanAllah, you fight him and you try to kill him. Now if you go hungry because of Thumama, not the Prophet, it was Thumama's decision. Now you're trying to play on the Prophet's emotions. So the Prophet ﷺ responded by sending a letter to Thumama. Thumama went back to Yamama. So the Prophet said to him, continue those shipments. Don't block those shipments of wheat to my people, my qawm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse in the Holy Quran, وَلَقَدْ أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْعَذَابِ فَمَا اسْتَكَانُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَمَا يَتَضَرَّعُونَ We punished them, we punished them, but they don't learn from their lessons, they don't become humble, meaning the Quraysh. Now is the objection of the Meccans founded here when they, tell, they, when they told the Prophet, you're not being good to your relatives of Quraysh by making them go hungry? Number one, it wasn't his decision. The Prophet never told Thumama, go and cut the wheat from them. It was his decision. Number two, they have no shame, the Meccans. You're trying to kill them. Why did he leave Mecca? Because you tried to assassinate him that night. And you've killed many Muslims. And you in the Shab of Abi Talib for three years, you made the Prophet eat grass, desert plants, just to survive. So it was okay for you to make the Muslims starve. Now when it's your turn, you're crying like a baby. Hey, you know, we're your relatives, what's happening? Their objection is not founded. They started the, 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 the problem with the Prophet They killed his uncle Hamza at Uhud. Now they accuse him of severing ties with them? How come you never kept good ties with him? So, assuming that this is a correct report, this shows the Prophet's mercy and compassion even with those who fought him. The Prophet is basically, you know, demonstrating beautiful lessons in mercy and compassion. Quraysh, you fought me, you tried to kill me, you killed my uncle Hamza, you made me almost starve for three years when I was in Mecca. And someone else, not me, Thumama decides to cut off the shipments from you and as a result you went hungry and you started eating desert vegetation. But since you've written me a letter and you've asked me for mercy, I'll have that mercy on you. This is the beautiful akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Here you know what an amazing leader he was, even with his own enemies. Who does that? When your enemies suffer and go hungry like, like that, you're waiting you know, for such a moment to see them suffer but not the Prophet. And yet after all this, they would not become Muslim. After all this, they still tried to fight him. What do you do with people like that? Didn't you see his Rahmah? Accept his Rahmah. He's a good leader. Why are you scared of the Prophet's leadership? When you've seen how he treats his own enemies who tried to kill him, you don't trust him that he's going to be good with you if you follow him? SubhanAllah, people would come and tell Quraysh, you guys have an asset when you have such a prophet. You'll be the leaders of the world, follow him. But look at what arrogance does. When you're stubborn and you're arrogant, you're blinded to the truth. You're blinded to your own success. You have a path to success, but you're blinded because of jealousy, because of arrogance. They were arrogant. We, the elders of Quraysh, this young 40-year-old man, he's trying to teach us. They couldn't accept that. It was their arrogance that blinded them. Or their jealousy, why him? Why did he receive revelation? Why didn't Jibreel come to me? They would say that to him. Why did Jibreel come to you? Let him come to me. Jealousy. Now we look at these events and we can see how ridiculous they are. But Allah will try us in our own lives in these two areas. Jealousy and arrogance. Sometimes I may not take the right decision because of arrogance. Because I've made a decision and I want to justify it and I'll just blindly continue justifying it. Even when it's brought to my attention, look, this was not right. 
but that's it. No, I've already made my decision. I've made a stance. I can't retract it. I can't go back. It's never wrong or shameful to admit that you're wrong. You know, the Imam Hussein told his killers on the day of Ashura. The, they told him that if we want to stop and switch sides and, you know, not fight you, it's going to be a source of shame for us. People will say they chickened out. They were cowards by not fighting. Do you know what the response of Imam Hussein was? When they told him, it's a shame, disgrace for us, ar alayna. If we are going to now switch sides or not fight you, we're going to be accused of being cowards who didn't properly fight. What did Imam Hussein tell them? The Imam salam told them in that last statement, وَالْعَارُ أَوْلَى مِنْ دُخُولِ النَّارِ The Imam told them, first of all, it's not a shame to side with the truth. Don't let society play with your mind. It's not a shame. Who told you it's a disgrace to stand with the grandson of the Prophet and to say no to Yazid? Who told you that's a disgrace? Secondly, let's say it is a disgrace. Let's say it's ar. Ar is better than nar. You see how the Imam worded it? Ar, disgrace and shame is better than the fire of hell. So what? Be disgraced in this dunya. But at least on the day of judgment you'll succeed. What's the point of preserving your dignity in front of people but then you're going to go to hell? Wal'aru awla min dukhul nari If you really think that it's disgraceful for you, that's better than entering the fire of hell. But they didn't get that point. Yes, yeah, someone like Hur did and a few others. They realized this point. But most of them, they led themselves into destruction. Therefore, one very important lesson that we must learn. Anytime you've realized you've done something wrong, but you're kind of shy, embarrassed, you feel shameful, disgraced to correct yourself, remember what Imam Hussein said on the day of Ashura. It's okay. Feel that disgrace. Let people shame you. It's better than being shamed by Allah on the day of judgment. As long as you know it's the truth, go ahead. Sacrifice for the truth. And it's never ar in Allah's eyes. It's never a disgrace in God's eyes for you to admit your mistakes. You had a fight with someone, misunderstanding with someone, whatever happened with someone. And you thought you were correct, but then you understand that you've also committed acts of injustice against, against that person. It's okay, go and apologize. Go and apologize, it's, nothing is shameful about that. Or if you've made a mistake, admit that you've made a mistake. Some people may say some negative things about you, but in the end, save yourself before Allah. And that is a beautiful lesson that we learn from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how, how his enemies treated him. They knew he was a prophet, they knew he was merciful, they knew he was compassionate. What blinded them? Their arrogance and jealousy. We can't go after him, that's it.